applications in the uh, that was just finalized on July 1. Um, we have with us today James Hacker. Uh, we're very lucky to have him. He's a principal consultant to the Senate Committee on Budget and Fiscal Review, and he covers not only housing issues, but also transportation and energy. Um, prior to this, he worked uh, as a finance budget analyst at the California Department of Finance, where he was responsible for uh, the state's tra transportation budget. And in general, he's been working on sustainable development issues overall for a really long time. So thank you, James, for joining us. Um, just kind of a, a background on Mountain Housing Council. I know you're all probably very familiar with who we are, but uh, just really quickly, just in case, um, we're a project of the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation. We bring together now 29 different partners um, to, to kind of brainstorm and, and uh, actualize housing solutions for our uh, housing crisis and kind of build on what, what we've put together as the housing needs assessment and tackle some of the challenges in our region, region including not only affordability, but also availability and variety for um, all types of categories of people. Um, we, the speaker series is part of kind of what we're providing in terms of our education and outreach programs, because we found that um, a lot of folks really kind of the, the beginning step of taking advantage of some of our housing opportunities and all the many programs that our partners are taking advantage of is to educate people on what's already out there. And also kind of some of the basic terms to be familiar with and uh, programs that we've got and um, you know, different opportunities that occur not only on a local, very local level, but also at the state level, which is what we're kind of going to talk about today. Um, and we try to provide a couple of these a month. They are free, so please welcome everyone and anyone to them. Um, we're kind of here to help everyone take advantage of housing solutions. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and segue into allowing James to present uh, what he's brought for us today on the state budget. So thanks again, James, for being with us. Great. Thanks, Tara. And thanks, everyone, for having me. Happy to be here. Um, can everybody hear me just fine? Yes. Are we good? Awesome. Great. Yeah. Um, important to figure that out now instead of three slides down the road. Um, so again, I'm James Hacker, Principal Budget with the Senate Committee on Budget and Fiscal Review. And here today, just to sort of give folks a rundown on what was included in this past budget in terms of housing and homelessness. And just a quick disclaimer, I'm not necessarily here representing, um, you know, the Senate itself or this, you know, the Senate Democratic Caucus or, or any individual members. I'm just sort of here to give folks a rundown on what's in the budget. Um, so with that, why don't we bounce on to the next slide? Um, so just a little bit of context for sort of what is in the budget this year and sort of how we got here. Um, you know, first of all, housing homelessness has been sort of a front of mind issue for both the legislature and the administration for a number of years now, like besides the ongoing COVID pandemic and currently wildfire season, um, housing homelessness is what our members hear about from their constituents more than basically any other issue, right? And we're seeing the, the same sort of drivers and the same issues that, that you all are, you know, the, the cost of living continues to rise uh, statewide. Um, most of driven by the high cost of housing. And we're seeing increases in the state homeless population uh, statewide, right? It's important to note this isn't in the last, you know, really four or five years, it's been clear this isn't just sort of an urban problem. You know, we've seen populations rise in Modoc County, just as we've seen them rise on LA's Skid Row. So it really is a statewide issue. Um, recognizing this, we've taken action over the last couple of years to, um, you know, sort of address these issues. Uh, just a couple of highlights that, you know, we've spent nearly $2 billion in direct aid, or I guess appropriated nearly $2 billion in direct aid to combat homelessness between 2018 and 2020. Uh, in 2018, we passed SB3, which was the Veterans and Affordable Housing Bond Act of 2018, which gave us roughly $4 billion in bond funding for a variety of housing and homelessness problems. But clearly, like those actions didn't solve the problem. You know, housing remains very expensive and the homeless population continues to rise. And the advent of the COVID pandemic really sort of highlighted that like this is a, a real crisis and something that we really do have to deal with, right? We need to do more. Um, you know, with sort of the, the economic recession, there were lots of folks who lost their sources of income. Um, you know, we've had state and federal eviction moratoriums that have helped to keep folks from losing their homes en masse, but those all have ticking clocks on them. 
um, you know, the homeless population has been sort of a hotbed of, of COVID infections. And so it's really just this sort of gnarly series of interlocking problems that we really do need to, to, to make progress on. Um, so with, with all that as background, um, you know, we came into 2021, honestly coming sort of into the second year of, of the pandemic here. Um, when we were writing the 2020 budget, we were sort of expecting this to be sort of an ongoing fiscal crisis and that wound up sort of not being the case, right? We came into the 21-22 budget with record resources. Um, you know, we've got an enormous budget this year um, and that has really given us the chance to put some of those resources to good use um, combating these problems. So if we go to the next slide, um, <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit about sort of what we did with all those resources. Um, so um, in short, first of all, this is new spending. So these are all new things that we have funded this year um, outside of sort of our ongoing state housing programs and the multifamily housing program or some of the bond funded programs. These are all new things we've appropriated money for this year. So big picture, it's $16.4 billion um, over two years. Um, in the first year, that's $7.3 billion for homelessness and $4.5 billion for housing. Most of those affordable housing funds are one time. Um, and that's followed up uh, in 22-23 with $4.6 billion in additional homelessness funding. Now, um, you won't necessarily see the 22-23 numbers in this year's budget bill, um, but this is money that we have committed to and have built into our fiscal plan for next year. So that will basically be sort of our baseline um, new spending for homelessness next year. Um, but the, the actionable number this year is at $11.8 billion in 21-22. So it, it's a lot of money and that's very exciting. Um, so why don't we jump on to the next slide and I can talk through some of the homelessness investments. Um, so first again, that two-year total for homelessness is $11.9 billion. And that is spread across a whole bunch of programs. So I'm, I'm happy to give folks uh, a rundown on what some of those programs are. It's spread across um, housing community development, the Homeless Coordinating and Financing Council, um, the Department of Social Services, Department of Healthcare Services, Cal OES. It's sort of all over the place, um, which is really exciting. But as a couple of um, highlights and sort of the, the big sort of marquee programs, uh, the first one is the uh, Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention Program. Um, or, or HAP, because we love our acronyms. Um, uh, basically, this is the continuation of the local aid program that we've done the last couple of years that allocates funding to um, counties, continuums of care, and the 13 largest cities in the state based on homeless population. And this year, we've um, provided $1 billion per, per year over the next two years um, to expand the HAP program, which is really exciting. That's the largest investment we've ever made in this space. Um, and we're hoping for a, a lot of progress, um, but that does come with significant accountability requirements on locals. So th there's a little chart there showing basically the annual allocation to the counties and COCs that make up the Tahoe area. Um, so, you know, we're looking at between three and a half and four um, million dollars per year to the area, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, uh, in terms of the accountability measures, what we've done in past years is basically just sort of, um, you know, created this program and said, here are the allowable uses, you know, evidence-based responses to homelessness, connect people to services, get them off the street, um, et cetera. Um, here is the allocation, go to town, tell us what you do with it. Uh, this year, we've shifted that up a little bit and basically made it a bit more of a conversation with the goal of um, driving outcomes. And in this case, the outcome that matters is a reduction in the unhoused population. So the way this is gonna work this year is the Homeless Coordinating Financing Council um, actually just finalized the overall allocations, which is where I pulled those numbers from. Uh, this fall, um, they'll release sort of the program requirements and program recipients, again, counties, continuums of care, and the big 13 uh, will basically agree to participate in the program and sign a standard agreement, at which point they will then get um, an initial portion of their funding um, either 20% or 20, 25%, depending on if they've agreed to work with somebody else or alone. Um, they can then use a chunk of that money to develop uh, sort of a local strategic homeless plan that'll basically say, um, here are our populations, here are our pain points, here's the resources we currently have, um, here are the gaps, and here's how he um, would like to, um, it, here's how we would like this money to close those gaps. Uh, with that, 
they also commit to a series of goals that are quantifiable um, and measurable to say like over the next three years, we will achieve the following goals in terms of um, you know, reduction in population, increase in um, successful housing placements, um, increase in street outreach, uh, et cetera. And then at the end of a three year, sorry, I got ahead of myself there. Um, once they've written that plan, they'll turn that in, HCFC accepts it, and then locals get the balance of their, um, balance of their payment then have three years to execute on that plan, at which point they get assessed relative to their goals. And if you've met your goals, uh, you get bonus funding. So we've set aside um, several hundred million dollars out of that billion dollar pot um, to be allocated once folks hit their goals. Again, the idea is to sort of provide that carrot to, to get folks to commit to something and then to execute on that um, to get the outcomes that we're all hoping for. Um, Somebody sent in a question asking for Nevada County numbers. That was an oversight on my part. Um, I will get those numbers in just a second uh, once we're done here. Um, the other big ticket, sort of big dollar items in homelessness, um, first is Project Home Key, which was the administration's big push last year um, to purchase uh, hotels and motels to convert them into housing and to non-congregate shelters for homeless individuals. Um, we funded that with federal emergency funding last year, and we're augmenting it with 2.75 billion over two years um, for additional uh, property purchases. But it's important to note that with this one, we're really pushing folks to think beyond sort of the hotel and motel paradigm, right? Those are likely not gonna be as attractive investments in the near future. So really the goal of this program is, this is sort of the capital program for um, purchasing and um, rehabilitating and converting uh, properties into non congregate shelters and affordable housing for the homeless, right? Whether that's um, a hotel or a motel, whether that is um, a vacant commercial property, um, it would have you like if there is a property that can be purchased and converted to housing, this is the pot of capital funds to do that. Um, alongside that, there's an additional two and a half billion over two years for behavioral health continuum infrastructure, uh, basically to, to help folks build or purchase and build um, uh, permanent supportive housing uh, for folks uh, with mental health issues. Um, so those are sort of the big ticket ones in homelessness. If we can go on to the next slide, uh, we'll go into housing. Um, so the 2021 total for housing, four and a half billion. Uh, again, these are all sort of one-time funds. We haven't, uh, there is not additional money in these programs for, uh, or sort of built in for next year. Um, but that doesn't mean that these won't be part of the conversation in the next budget. Um, the big picture or the big ticket items in this one, um, first there's 1.75 billion for the affordable housing backlog program. Uh, basically there's a bunch of affordable housing projects out there that have received state funding um, through you know, an HCD program, whether that's multifamily housing program or one of the bond funded programs um, and have qualified for a state low income housing tax credit and a private activity bond. But because there are not enough bonds to go around, um, they didn't receive one. So they're eligible, they're um, you know, ready to go affordable housing projects. And so we've set aside 1.75 billion in state money, basically to buy the tax credit and the bond equity from these projects, give them the cash infusion, instead of making them wait around for a bond allocation in a future year. So basically we can just sort of purchase that equity, get them built, and then whoever's in the pipeline behind them can then move up in line for the tax credits and bonds. Um, there's an additional $300 million for the preservation of state funded affordable housing. These are projects that were built, you know, years ago and either their covenants are expiring or there are cost pressures or repairs that they need to make, um, that they otherwise would have to move out of sort of the affordable, um, space to pay for. So this is $300 million to sort of cover those costs and to make sure those covenants stay in place to make sure we don't lose affordable housing units, um, across the state. Um, and then the last sort of big one here is the Regional Early Action Planning Program of 2021. This is $600 million in planning and implementation grants um, modeled after the what we called the REAP program uh, back in 2019 um, to help locals either plan for or implement projects that both meet housing goals and meet certain transportation goals, particularly around um, reductions in per capita VMT. Um, so this means things like studying um, congestion pricing and its impact on housing development, um, you know, planning for constructing multimodal communities, um, you know, helping with active transportation implementation in sort of housing plans, uh, stuff like that. 
Um, that 600 million, 85% uh, of it is allocated to MPOs, including the TRPA, who I think is slated to get about um, $600,000 out of it. Um, then there's, a, there's another 5% available on a competitive basis for rural counties, 5% for uh, what they're calling exemplary projects, basically projects that do everything the program is supposed to do, but more, right? These are more exciting or, uh, you know, sort of um, high profile, you know, multimodal communities, trans oriented development, sort of multidisciplinary um, housing and transportation projects that are sort of a demonstration of, of what we can accomplish here. Um, so those are sort of the, the high, the, the big ticket items. And if we go one more slide, I think I have a summary chart of all the new housing funding. Um, again, the homelessness list was too long to fit on one slide, but these are sort of all of the new housing dollars we've got. So you'll see the affordable housing backlog, preservation, um, regional early action program. There's another 500 million in foreclosure intervention um, dollars basically to allow um, nonprofits, land trusts, um, affordable developers, um, et cetera, to either um, prevent properties from falling into foreclosure or to purchase them out of foreclosure to um, either prevent the loss of affordable housing or to expand the number of affordable housing units in the state out of the foreclosure process. Um, you'll see $500 million for the low income housing tax credit program, which is something we've done the last several years. Um, additional money for infill infrastructure and then two programs uh, at Cal HFA, which is an additional $81 million for ADU financing. This is something they've already been piloting in the Central Valley to basically create a financing product for um, ADU construction and ADU development, whether that is in sort of a like a tiny home village model or as sort of a um, construction of an ADU on a personal property in sort of lower income areas as a way to expand affordable housing options there. Um, and then an additional $100 million for um, first time home buyers down payment assistance program just to sort of um, expand the capital available to get people into affordable housing. Um, so that's the presentation. Again, lots of uh, lots of new money and a lot of exciting things. A lot of these things, um, you know, these were all included in the June budget. Uh, we are still haggling over plenty of things um, in the Capitol. You know, we've got four more weeks to the end of session. A lot of these programs are just getting spun up. So I mentioned the, the homeless program will likely see those applications sometime this fall. Uh, the backlog program will likely be going sometime this fall. Um, home key should be up and running with the new funding um, sometime in the next month or two. Um, so lots of stuff getting up and, and getting going. Um, so with that, uh, hopefully that was sort of a helpful um, high level overview. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that folks may have. Great. Thank you, James. And if it's OK with you, I'd like to post some of your charts in connection with this um with this webinar, because I think it might be helpful to just have those on hand to kind of save us doing a lot of searching online. Um, there was a question about budget for seniors, um, mm -hmm. specifically for local residents. I did I did find something online that indicated that there's almost four billion in new funding to build quote age friendly housing and a master plan for aging. I'm not sure if that's something you you know about or involved or involved with. Yeah, so I mean, sometimes when you see releases like that, you know, it's sort of an aggregate of a bunch of different things. Um, so there's there's certainly um, money out there for the master plan on aging. That's something our folks have been working on for a while. Um, in terms of sort of age friendly housing, I'm going back into my master budget chart here, um, which sometimes is kind of a beast. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have. Um, a number of programs that we funded this year through the Department of Social Services, um, one of which is the Home Safe Program, mm -hmm. um, which I believe has provided funding for sort of senior supportive housing and the like. And that's, uh, I think we funded that to the tune of $185 million over two years. Um, DHCS, you know, some of the room key money has gone for sort of senior specific and, and age friendly housing. Some of the behavioral healthcare infrastructure funding could go to that. And there's also additional money out there for um, adult residential facilities and res residential care facilities for the elderly. Um, 
And if you'll give me a second, I will find the numbers for that. Great. Hopefully. Um, awesome. Thank you. Great. And Lynn, I'm give me a second to, to, to dig that up. Yeah, Sorry, that there's, eight, there's $805 million for the, for the expansion of the community care pilot, and that does include funding for ARFs and RCFEs. Um, I want to say that's to the tune of about $150 million, but I, I might have just lied to you all. So um, maybe don't quote me and I'll confirm that one. Great. That's great. Um, somebody also asked about the um, Nevada County numbers. Yeah, I'm having a hard time um, finding them online. Yeah, apologies. And that was an oversight on my part. Nevada County, the county itself, um, we're getting just under $580,000 per year out of this allocation. Um, and the COC will get just over $620,000. Great. And again, that is, that is per year um, for two years. Awesome. That's great. So in general, should, should folks who want to apply for some of this money who run our programs like our homeless services of North Tahoe, Truckee, and AMI housing, should they basically just look to their local county to provide them with the info on how to do that? Is that basically the only way you get it? Um, it depends on the program. Um, the short answer is no, but a lot of these programs will run through the counties. Um, so of the programs that, that I mentioned, um, you know, in, in the homelessness space, for example, um, the, the HAP program, you know, that money is going to go through the Big 13, which, you know, is, is less relevant here. Um, and then the counties and the COCs. And the counties and the COCs will each get their own allocation. Okay. And so it's important to go through or, or to, to be in contact with both of those entities to the extent that they differ um, to, to make sure that you're sort of in line and dealing with the folks who will actually have responsibility for implementing that money. Um, you know, the behavioral health continuum infrastructure program, my understanding is that will go through the counties as well. Uh, project home key will go through cities or counties, basically a local government has to bring the project forward and they'll bring it forward to the extent that there are, are other partners, they'll bring it forward in partnership with a local nonprofit or a local affordable housing developer or, or what have you. But the, the local governments are sort of the actionable entities there. Um, in, in terms of housing, it sort of varies by program. Um, you know, for the, the regional early action planning program, those housing and transportation grants that I mentioned, um, those go out either to MPOs or to counties. Um, okay. And so the sort of those local entities will be the ones who are responsible for implementing it and chasing that money. Okay. Um, in terms of the backlog, you know, the, the affordable housing backlog, the housing preservation, the foreclosure intervention program, um, those are all effectively competitive programs going through the Department of Housing and Community Development. Okay. Um, so the department should be putting out um, either the pro either starting the process to develop the guidelines or putting out the guidelines for those programs sometime in the next couple of months. Um, you know, we did saddle them with a lot of new stuff here. Mm -hmm. um, so they're a little bit slammed and are definitely going to be working hard in the coming weeks and months. Um, to get all this stuff up and running, but they should get that process moving here relatively soon. Um, you know, there over the next couple of weeks, it's a bit of an awkward situation because we're still in session, and theoretically, we could still change this stuff. Um, oh, I don't think we necessarily have an interest in doing that. Okay. Um, but you know, they're trying to get things moving, um, get anything moving that they can without sort of getting themselves stuck if something changes. Okay. Great. Um, in terms of rental assistance, though, and applying for that, that is still kind of something individuals can do to directly to the state of California. They don't necessarily do that through their localities, especially if it's COVID-19 related, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, correct. And you guys will notice that I didn't include the rental assistance money on this chart. Um, that is 100% federally funded. We don't have any state dollars in okay. there. Um, and so we're sort of bound by the federal requirements on it. Um, okay. You know, on the plus side, there's like several billion dollars worth of federal funds out there, which is great. Um, great. We're sort of stuck with, that sounds pejorative. We're, we're implementing, implementing that program based on federal guidelines. And um, depending on where you are, the money will either be um, implemented by uh, a local jurisdiction, likely a county or the state. I don't think there are any locals running their own federally funded programs in the Tahoe area. 
Um, so everything should be going through HCD on this one. Okay. Um, the website, I think, is housingiskey.com. And that will connect folks with sort of the information they need to apply. Oh, great. Um, okay. You know, the, the program, there's sort of the, the two lanes by which individuals can get rental assistance funds. They either go through their landlords. Mm -hmm. um, or if their landlord doesn't participate, they can then pursue that money themselves. Um, but you basically have to show that, like, you try to go through your landlord. Um, but but that is individually driven. There is no sort of, um, it's not like there's a, like the, the county is aggregating all these um, applications and then sending them to us for processing. Like folks who are applying directly to the HCD program. Okay, great. Well, and I know there's other, there's a bunch of other programs that individuals can, um, can apply for. For example, there's long-term loans uh, to ensure affordability for um, mobile home park rehabilitation and resident ownership and things like that. So mm -hmm. um, are there any particular deadlines we should be aware of just in general that are in place yet um, that you know of kind of months we should be on the lookout, I guess? Yeah, so in terms of um, the new funding, I would say start checking with HCD um, around mid-September. Okay. Um, Part of the challenge with sort of the state housing budget is that the programs are all over the place. Right, and we sort of, right. we run the programs based on um, sort of various, uh, we're called NOFA rounds. Um, so I can pull, there's a chart on HCD's website that shows basically all the NOFAs they have planned over the next 12 month period, wow, okay. which will show like when the bond funded programs are coming online or the, the new funding is becoming available. Um, when, um, you know, the multifamily housing program is doing another NOFA, um, when the CERNA farm worker housing program is doing another NOFA, um, and they're sort of rolling, um, hmm, okay. which is, again, sort of a, a challenge implementation-wise. It's not like we make the money available in June, mm -hmm. and then, you know, there's a, there's a round of funding that becomes available in, like, July and August, and then, like, that's it. You know, they, they come, it is, they're sort of available on a rolling basis. Gotcha. Um, it, the exceptions are, I, I guess the ones to highlight, not so much exceptions, but the, the ones to highlight, um, things that I can do off the top of my head. I, I know that the low income housing tax credit program, uh, does two right. rounds a year. They did one back in the spring and they're doing another one later this fall, um, which I think is in the October, November timeline. Okay. Uh, and that'll happen roughly along the same timeline as the bond allocation, because the tax credit has to be paired with a bond, um, which happy to talk about if, if folks have questions on that because it okay. is um, complicated and crazy. Um, okay. uh, but that'll become available later this fall. Um, a lot of the new programs, the, the backlog, home key, preservation, a lot of those are available on sort of a rolling basis. Um, so with home key, I know that there is not a deadline by which HCD has to start the process. Okay. They're aiming to get that program rolling in September. Okay. And the timeline really is on sort of the, the, the project implementer once you receive funding, right? HCD okay. is sort of, their goal is to maintain flexibility in that program to make sure that we are, um, you know, one, providing sort of uh, geographic equity across the state in terms of who gets money, right? Um, we don't want, you know, to spend 99% of the money in LA and 1% in the rest of the state. I feel like I'm beating up on LA a little bit, which is not my intention. <laughs> but like LA is, is the biggest metropolitan area in the state, right? And like there's a huge need there. Right. And we could very easily spend tons and tons of money there. But that's not necessarily the goal. The goal is to make sure that we're providing, you know, affordable housing and non-congregate shelters for folks through home key sort of on a statewide basis. Because again, that is really a statewide problem. Um, I think once HCD makes the funding available and once they make an award, um, mm. there is an eight month clock to start the project, right? Those projects are supposed to be sort of shovel ready. Like we're purchasing this, right. this property um, and then we are gonna convert it into housing. So once we've purchased it, we, we close on, um, you know, sort of close on that, on, on the funding and then start actual implementation within eight months to make sure that again, we're getting units as quickly as possible. Gotcha. Um, but again, that's sort of driven by the locals turning applications that um, HCD can accept. Gotcha. Um, with the the HAP program, that Homeless Direct Aid program, um, again, HCFC just made the allocations available about a week ago. Okay. Um, they should be releasing 
the requirements for the program and those standard agreements that I mentioned um, sometime in September, I believe is, is the plan, at which point locals then um, you know, sign the standard agreement, get their initial allocation, and then effectively have until the end of the fiscal year to turn in your strategic plan and get the balance of the money. At that point, the onus then shifts sort of to locals to get their, get their ducks in a row, get their plan set up, set their goals, um, and turn that in so that they can then hit the ground running with the money that they're going to get from the state for that purpose. Gotcha. Okay. Great. There's anything else here that it's really um, helpful. It sounds yeah. like hcd.ca.gov is kind of everybody's go-to for finding out about these this funding for housing. Yes, um, that is a useful resource. It is not always the easiest website to navigate. Yeah. Um, uh, but I will pull up the calendar. And this is a little out of date. Um, I'll put it right in the chat. Oops. Okay, thanks. Um, this is as of May. Okay. Um, so this will be updated in the near future now that we've thrown many billions of more dollars at them. <laughs> um, but this will, so this is sort of the roadmap by which they will be working. Okay, great. Thanks, James. So in addition to, or, you know, nonprofits that work on homelessness and supportive housing, we also, I see, have our employers uh, on the call. We have our local jurisdictions, like folks who head up the town of Truckee uh, and Placer County on the call. Is there anything in particular they should be kind of um, aware of that they may not already know about in terms of funding opportunities? Yeah, specific sort of to, to homelessness and housing, you know, in this case. Um, any housing, yeah, yeah, any and all housing, yeah. Um, you, you know, like there's a lot of money that's out there. And the goal yeah. is to get it moving as quickly as possible. And we've okay. sort of done what we can to, to sort of make that easier, right? There's lots of sort of, we've, we've made plenty of policy changes in recent years to make it easier to permit and to build housing. We put lots of planning money out there to, to sort of allow folks to plan for additional housing and to execute it. Um, you know, if they're, I guess the, the big sort of messages are, um, you know, one in terms of, of homelessness, like that HAP money is is going to be getting out there in the near future. And, you know, we're asking a lot of locals, right, come up with a plan, tell us how you're going to spend it, set some goals that we're, we're genuinely going to hold you to account for, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of a difficult situation. But like, um, you know, if folks sort of jump on board and get strategic about setting those goals and, and being really sort of uh, deliberate in how we pursue those goals, mm -hmm. um, you know, that'll get us all moving the, the right direction. There's um, you know, a billion dollars going out this year, an additional billion dollars next year. So we're putting real money behind this. Um, we would love to do additional money in the out years as well. And it'll be easier to do that if we start seeing some real progress on these things. Okay. Um, in terms of the housing funds, um, you know, if you've got affordable housing developments that are in the pipe or are stalled and waiting for an allocation or, um, you know, are, are sort of struggling to get off the ground, um, you know, there's a lot of money going out this year, whether that's through the backlog, um, whether that's through the foreclosure intervention program, um, whether that's sort of the, the, you know, the infill infrastructure grant program to help some of the larger developments pencil out by limiting some of their overall infrastructure costs. Um, you know, we're pushing that money out the door as quickly as we can. And so um, to the extent that those projects are, are, stall are stalled or are working or are looking for money, um, mm -hmm. you know, point developers to those programs because there's a lot of money that's going to be out there. Um, and the faster we can get it out the door and the faster we can get some of this housing built, um, the easier it is to, to provide more money in the future. Um, right. And the more we can start building on some, you know, building on our, our progress and, and really start moving things forward on this. Great. So, um, yeah, and I know a lot of, a lot of folks um, tuned in on this call are kind of really familiar with the COCs and home key and, and funding that's been there before. I'm just wondering if there's anything completely brand new that we should really bring folks attention to, because um, those folks already know what they're doing in terms of applying for, you know, certain grants every year. Is yeah. anything like really stands out to you as being like a completely new program that people should be aware of? Like, I don't know if the local housing trust fund program has always been around, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one's been around and it's been funded. Um, I think that one got SB2 allocations um, back when we passed SB2. Um, okay. You know, sort of all the new programs are highlighted in the presentation. Oh, great. Um, okay. That's um, 
and, and I do have a, a larger chart that sort of shows all of the programs that count towards this $16.4 billion and, and sort of who's imp or who is responsible for them, um, which we can share after the sort of after this call. Um, you know, the, the big new ones really are, are sort of the, you know, the additional stuff we're asking for for HAP, um, the expansion of home key and the behavioral healthcare infrastructure, um, that new REAP program. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're pushing a lot of money out the door um, and hopefully we can really make, make a difference on this. Um, there's additional money sort of in, in Department of Social Services and HCS, or sorry, Department of Healthcare Services. Again, we love acronyms here at the state. <laughs> um, you know, for the expansion and sort of community care pilots, um, for, for Calium expansion, um, for um, sort of wind down of project room key as we're sort of transitioning out of the, the depths of the pandemic and into this sort of like this new footing, like how do we move forward from, from now? Okay. Um, you know, all of which will be moving out in the near future. So I can provide um, a summary after the call. That's great, James. This is so, so helpful. Thank you so much. Um, does anybody have any last questions for James that they want while we have him? Oh, yes, Shauna Pervines. I just saw your hand up. Hi, thank Hi. you. Yeah. Uh, just a real quick question on the REAP. Um, is there any more detail that's coming down? I know it's kind of the REAP 2.0, and I know it's probably coming down through the um, uh, our COGS, through our regional planning agencies. Correct. But I just, is there any more detail on that? I know I've been in contact with SACOG, and I think there too are seeking some additional information. Um, my understanding is it's still gonna be kind of focused in on infrastructure and their green means go kind of program, but mm -hmm. any additional information would be helpful. Yeah, and it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty broadly written program. It'll be run through HCD with input from um, OP, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, the Air Resources Board, um, input from the transportation and housing work group which includes folks like caltrans the california transportation commission you know arb arb epa um etc and sort of big picture of the goal is to to fund projects and either like implementation of specific projects right which could be some of those infrastructure type projects um or plans or sort of policy initiatives that achieve both um, housing goals and reduction in per capita um vmt so that could include things like sort of the green means go like suite of projects. Um, it could mean things like planning for um, transit oriented development, planning for um, uh, you know, congestion pricing within a particular cordon, um, planning for um, greater density or infill development. And that could include um, you know, an infrastructure component, but it's worth pointing out we also have $534 million for the infill infrastructure grant program this year. So there's, there's also lots of money um, chasing those projects. Um, uh, you know, again, pretty broadly written, but meant to sort of um, push folks to plan for sort of those multidisciplinary project development process type things, or if they're already there to fund part of the implementation of them. Um, like you said, the money, 85% of the money goes out via the MPOs. Um, there's also a 5% competitive program for what we've called exemplary projects, which the bill um, or the, the, the language doesn't provide a whole lot of detail on, but it's basically um, projects that meet both housing and transportation goals, but do it better than the other projects we would otherwise fund. Um, and that will be ran through HCD, I apologize, just wanted to- Correct, yeah, HCD okay. um, is sort of the primary administrator of that, but it is with input from OPR and ARB, as well as the transportation and housing work group. So that, that, I'm just trying to figure out who would be judging the exemplary. <laughs> um, so HCD will be driving sort of the application okay. process um, in terms of, of who is applying for that. You know, TRPA will get their specific allocation okay. um, uh, as well as we'll be driving um, sort of the application process for those from the local level, right? Trying to bring projects forward to HCD and OPR to say like, this is an exemplary project, please give us extra money. Perfect. And then the money you mentioned for the infill infrastructure, that was additional money that's coming down through this, right? In addition to or? Correct. That's that's in addition to, that's not part of the $600 million here. Um, the, right. the infill infrastructure grant program is, has been around for a while and we've made tweaks to it. 
And, and this year, basically, we cobbled together some additional federal funds and then accelerated the bond funding that we had planned for the next couple of years okay. um, that would that sort of by statute goes to the IIG and funneled it all into this year. Um, Great. So more than half a billion dollars for infill infrastructure. Um, and that also includes, um, I think there's a $90 million um, rural set aside for um, smaller, more rural counties so that folks aren't competing with the the LAs and the Bay Areas. Um, I think well, unfortunately um, though for Placer County is we got lumped into the Bay Area. So Placer mm -hmm. County is competing with LA and San Francisco, which makes us not very competitive for those. Gotcha. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. Anytime you start drawing lines. Um, it makes it hard, yep. Yeah, you, you create some, some strange outcomes. Yeah. So James, um, Heidi Drum had a question about kind of the difference between what TRPA would get versus some of the cities and whether it's an either or or an and. Uh, so for example, would you know, South Lake Tahoe um, have access funding through the um, Sacramento Area Council of Government or um, in addition to what TRPA is getting or is it kind of one and the other in terms of how things play out on the ground? Yeah, I mean, in terms of, um, you know, the Tahoe Basin is a little, um, on this program because you have a bunch of overlapping folks, right? TRPA and SACOG also touches the area and, and, and all that jazz. Mm -hmm. um, so my understanding is it would basically be both since both are gonna get money. Oh, um, great. You know, the nice thing about TRPA is that you don't necessarily have to compete with the city of Sacramento for SACOG money, to the extent that they're getting a direct allocation here. Okay. Um, you know, this is one of those, those issues that we've had conversations about whether we need some kind of cleanup um, so maybe stay tuned on this one. Okay. Um, but you know, sort of the the mixing and matching of jurisdictions here is something that we're aware of. Um, but it, as currently written, my read, um, maybe the lawyers will disagree with me, but um, my read is that it would be a both situation, right? Both awesome. folks are going to get an allocation. Both folks are going to sub allocate or fund projects within their jurisdiction. Um, you know, both folks are, are options um, if you're under them. So. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, James. Does anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, I see Heidi's comment about Chase, got... working with Egon. So we're having the same conversations. Yeah. Great. Alex, were you speaking or someone else? Uh, go ahead, Chase. Uh, oh, Chase. Okay. Thanks, James. Thanks, Tara. Uh, quick question, James. Are, are you aware of any funding that might be eligible for a housing entity? Um, you know, and we don't have a housing authority that's particularly active in the basin. Are those the kinds of things that there might be a dedicated funding source or are they all mostly construction? In terms of sort of like funding the creation of a of sort of a, um, you know, a housing authority type organization or, or sort of. Exactly. Entity? Yeah. yeah. Um, off the top of my head, um, I don't think necessarily like targeted at it, although I, I think that would potentially, I'll have to go back and reread the language, but we did talk about um, sort of building capacity in those REIT programs, right? If we want to sort of stand up, um, um, you know, one of these entities, you're like, this is part of our planning process. Like you, you could potentially get some money that way. It sort of depends on how the guidelines are written. Um, we did provide some money for the creation of housing authorities, um, but I think the bulk of that is spoken for. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Any last question for James before we kind of break? Great. Well, thank you so much again, James. I hope it's okay. I did provide your email. <laughs> um, so really appreciate your help and your dedication to this. So thank you yeah. so much. Uh, happy to help. If, if folks have um, additional questions or want more information, feel free to shoot me a note and I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as I can. I know this was sort of like a super high level overview um, and was maybe less focused on sort of like the nuts and bolts implementation. You know, we're still figuring a lot of that out um, or rather HCD really is. Um, but um, to the extent that you're looking for more information, just shoot me a note. I can either provide it to you or point you to somebody um, who knows. Excellent. And it's really helpful to know that September is really the month we also have to be very alert and aware and kind of get everything in. So thank you. Yeah, that's. That's, I, again, I think September is when you should start following, you know, the HCD and sort of the, the DSS, like, 
um, notifications and announcements, because that is, my guess is when we're going to start seeing some of the guidelines rolling out for these things. Okay. Um, you know, I, I shared the NOFA calendar, um, which is, is pretty exhaustive, but is as of May. Um, and obviously we threw a lot more money at them since then. So I'm, I'm guessing that calendar may get updated in the near future. Okay, gotcha. All right, excellent. Well, thank you, James. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you inviting me. Thanks. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. You too. Bye. Jimmy and Sana, if you don't have any questions, I'm going to end the Zoom.